Hello, everybody. San Diego has been ranked as the greenest city in America for many years straight by many different reports. With all of our streets, our parks, our gardens, uh, you probably know this, we have so many shrubs and succulents and trees. It's pretty amazing the amount of green space that we have here in Southern California. We also host one of, if not the best zoo in the world as well. But a hundred years ago, here in San Diego, it was not this case. Actually, it was pretty barren, the landscape. Enter a young woman in her mid-20s who comes down to San Diego. I imagine like an inspirational movie with her bags packed. And she goes up to an open field in San Diego, puts them down, and, and looks over the wide barrenness of San Diego, and she has a dream. She has a dream to turn this landscape from barren to lush. What do you do with such a monumental vision that she did? Well, you start with one seed, and then the next, and then the next, and over decades and decades, she transformed this region from this to this. Not only did she transform the landscape, she actually helped San Diego go from black and white to color. <laughs> the woman I'm talking about is named Kate Sessions. She's known as the mother of Balboa Park, uh, the Johnny Apple Seed of San Diego. Many of the mature trees that you actually see in Balboa Park were actually hand planted by her. Uh, I had an opportunity with my wife to actually meet her in person. Uh, it was amazing. She <laughs> was a little bit more stoic than I thought she would be, but it was a great first meeting nonetheless. Hi, my name is Jake Veda. I've been a pastor here for seven years alongside my wife, who has been here for 17 years. Not that it's a competition, but I am pretty mad about that. Collectively, being here for 23 years, this has been home for us, and recently, we are leaving the nest So, uh, with, with a mission to plant a new church in the heart of San Diego this fall. We are actually, fun fact, the 56th church that Eastlake has planted over 35 years. Yes. And I'm glad you're clapping because it's because of your generosity that Eastlake has been able to plant 50 plus churches over the last several decades. But we, you know, we're excited to, to be here today. And Keely and I, we feel pretty similar to Kate Sessions, like with our bags packed and looking at San Diego. And sometimes for us, uh, it, it can be a little, little nerve wracking because what we, what we see is actually similar to what the landscape was 100 years ago in San Diego. Uh, uh, somebody mentioned before she got here, Kate Session, that the land was empty, but the soil was fertile. And we look spiritually at the landscape of San Diego, and we actually see something similar. The land is empty, but the soil is fertile. Where we are planting is called North Park, which, raise your hand if you've been to North Park. Maybe, okay, literally every single person. <laughs> Within a 15-minute driving radius, there's 1.4 million people in North Park in that area, and yet there's only a handful of churches over 100 people. It's virtually uncharted territory in 2024, empty. But we see it as fertile soil, in part because we boast one of the highest concentration, concentration of people who are pursuing higher education, 7%. Beyond that, people want healthier marriages. They want a connected soul. They just don't have a place to do that. And that's why Kaylee and I are planting Create Church in the heart of San Diego this fall. But we could not do any of this without the 23 years that we spent here. Uh, growing up, I've just last uh, week talking to many of you guys after service, 
And one of my favorite things I hear is, we saw you grow up here. I was like, yes, you did. Um, and for me, it's, it's through the, the marination. Uh, is that a word? Marination? <laughs> Marinating here for so many years. That's the only reason that we can do what we're doing. It's because of the community here. And that's what I want to talk about today is community. It's our special sauce here at Eastlake Church, our community. So we're actually in the second week of a series called The Church in Here, The Church Out There. Last week, James set up the talk by basically saying we're, we're kind of like the in and out of churches. In other words, we focus on five things that we do really, really well And I want to talk about those five things. We're not Cheesecake Factory. They do 200 things, and, you know, that's overwhelming for me. I don't know about you. It's nice going to In-N-Out and knowing exactly what to order because there's only a specific set of things. And that's what it is here at Eastlake. And because we love trying to make it memorable, they're all Gs, the five things that we do here. So here they are. The first one is gather, then it's grow, group, give, and go. Today, I want to be talking about the church in here, which is actually two of those, which is gather and group. At the heart of what we do here is gathering and grouping. Just like Kate Sessions understood that when you plant a tree, when you put a seed in the ground, it's not for today, right? It's for tomorrow. 35 years ago, a group of people that are still, some uh, some of them still attending church here, Realize that if they gathered, if they grouped in the early ni- in, in the early nineties, what what could we create together? And through their community comes what we have today, through gathering and through grouping. And some of you today, this talk might be a refresher because you have been a blessed recipient of the community here, the the stability, the hope uh, that you've you've seen here, maybe it's transformed your life. For some of you, this talk is actually going to be an invitation. Whether you've lapsed and you're saying, I want to jump back into community or re-engage, or maybe for some of you, this is your first time ever hearing about what we do in here. And if that's you, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I'm going to invite out Carla. Uh, Carla is one of our pastors, and Carla and I are actually friends, which is awesome. Uh, We actually did our master's together uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I can attest that Carla is that student who uh, writes everything the professor says down. True, true. True. Uh, and it was great because at the end I could, I could just uh, take the notes. So it was true, awesome. True, true. So today we decided to actually uh, do the talk together in collaboration. Uh, so if it sucks, it's her fault. If only, if only we were all as confident as Jake Veda, okay? And listen, sisters, we know how this works. The work we do and these boys just copy. We got it, okay. Okay, to help us get anchored in why we gather in group in here as a church family and how we gather in group and what we believe we're called to do when we gather in group as a church family, we're gonna be looking at Acts 2. This is a passage, a section of scripture called the life or the fellowship of believers. This passage is a description of what what the early church looked like in Jerusalem. But church tradition and scholars would say that this section of scripture is not merely meant to be a historical retelling. Rather that Luke, the author of this book, was trying to give us a big picture of how the church is supposed to function and what it's supposed to look like when the church gathers together. As we look at this passage, I also want to quickly highlight some of the important context around this passage, and that is Acts 2 is the chapter in which the Holy Spirit comes to earth. Jesus had told the believers that when he was gone, he would send the Holy Spirit to help them live faithfully. And the idea of the Holy Spirit coming was a game changer. And that happens right before the passage that we're about to look at right now. So let's read Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. And if you're following along, I am going to interject as we go, so don't get lost. The fellowship of believers, they, those who believed, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled in awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. In other words, good things were happening here. It wasn't merely a place where people were talking about God. Verse 44. 
All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possession to give to anyone who had need, which means this was a remarkably generous community, but in addition, that they also displayed a level of hospitality that allowed people from different socioeconomic groups to come and be a part. Verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They were gathering and grouping and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. They worshiped, they gave thanks and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved. So God's spirit comes to earth to help people live faithfully. And one of the first thing Luke wants us to know is that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit empowers the church as a whole to live as a certain type of community. Emphasis in Acts 2 is placed on the devotion of the community as a whole. God wanting to form and shape a certain kind of community was something we see throughout Scripture. But now God's people have access to God's Spirit in a new way, and the Spirit is going to help them be that different kind of community. Now, here at Eastlake, we believe that there are application steps in Acts 2 that matter to us today, whether we are gathering in rows like in these larger venues or we're gathering in smaller environments like in groups. Acts 2 help us to understand what the church is to be about when the Holy Spirit moves amongst his people. If you're taking notes, here's your first fill-in. Acts 2 teaches us that when we gather and we group together, we worship God. Acts 2 shows us that this community was marked by a collective devotion of, that was rooted in people deciding to center God. That God was placed at the center of this community in very, general, very specific ways and in various ways. The church, God's family, is supposed to be a type of community marked by collective devotion to God. In other words, the church is built on a commitment to Jesus, not on personal preferences or even compatibility. In this way, the church is meant to be a place of really unlikely friendships. Here we find ourselves connected to people um, that ultimately we might stand divided with in other areas of life. But when we come together and place God at the center, we honor our mutual equality and the connectedness we have in Christ. In Galatians 3, 28, we read, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you, for we, are all one in Christ Jesus. Our collective worship, it orients us, the church family, towards God. Here we get to stand shoulder to shoulder before the one that we collectively call the Lord. Just a few weeks ago, we um, celebrated Good Friday, and one of the things we did during that service is that we all wrote some of our hurts or habits and hang-ups on these papers, and then at a particular time in service, we were invited to go nail that paper to one of the crosses that were out here in the room. And in the back of the room, I just wept. I was a tender, tender mess. Because here's what I know. I know personally speaking, life is hard. And as one of the pastors on our pastoral team, I know that life is hard for you too. The waves of life do not stop coming. They just come and they come. Being an adult is hard and there is no summer vacation. That's not the way it works. But there was something about Good Friday where we were all individually and in turn collectively able to say, I humbly acknowledge I need and want God. That just ripped my heart open because what it perfectly displayed is this is what it means to be the church. This is what it means for us to be the family of God. It's us saying here we want to center God. When we gather in rows and we sing songs of worship, we are agreeing to center God. When we devote our time to listening to a sermon or to pray together, we are centering God. When we take communion, we are collectively saying, God, we want to center you. And whether we feel it or not, Scripture tells us that when we center God, that God is with us. Here's what Matthew 18, 20 says. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. When we worship, we remind ourselves of who God is, of who we are individually and collectively, and what our life is to meant to be about. 
which leads us to our next fill-in. When we gather in group in here, whether in service or in smaller groups, God's Spirit looks to disciple the church. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, to be a person of faith was to be a person of a certain ethic. We are not saved by our behavior, and we all fall short of the glory of God, some of us right here more than others. But ultimately, Scripture tells us that a genuine maturing faith provokes and invite us, invites us, it calls us to live towards that which reflects the heart of Scripture and Jesus, which is to love God and to love others. If you were here last week, Pastor James talked about the great commandment. Scripture tells us that God desires to help us grow, that this is in large part what the Holy Spirit does. And part of us following Jesus is us actively choosing to be a part of that transformational work. As Christians, we live assuming that God desires to help disciple us into more loving people. In this sense, there is no question that the church, the family of God, is meant to be a learning community. Here we are confident that God loves us, and here we are confident that God desires to heal what is broken in us. Here at Eastlake, we know that discipleship, this process of becoming more like Jesus, it happens in rows here in service, and it happens in smaller spaces, like in groups where people know our names and they know our stories. Last week, I was having breakfast with a friend I deeply respect from our church, our church Dr. Shanti Hands, and I left that meal full of gratitude because her willingness to see me as a sister in Christ, I know that it's maturing me. And the reason I know that that time with her is maturing me is because since I showed up at this church, I know that I have been fundamentally changed by people who have allowed me to walk with them. Just this last couple weeks, I was walking through a particular challenge, and I found myself drawing strength and wisdom from something I saw Carmen Meeks, one of our founding pastors, do over 15 years ago. I know that ultimately the lives we live, the life you live, it does something to the people around you. It models something. It shapes us. Listen, I have even learned from Pastor James, right? <laughs> God can use anyone to shape you, to help us become more like Jesus. God is always leading his people towards transformation. So when we gather in group, may we assume God is going to use this time to shape me. And may we surrender and submit to the ways in which Jesus is calling us forward. I love how theologian Joel Matamali says, humility is the soil in which the fruit of the Spirit grows. And tied to this, I pray and I hope that while our church is so far from perfect, you sense and you see that in this church we aim to be the type of church where it's okay to not be okay. That as long as we take responsibility for our individual issues, that it's okay to be in process here. Like Pastor Jake mentioned earlier, we understand that a seed becoming a tree, it takes time. Which leads us to another practice we learn, we lean into when we gather in group in here. We encourage one another. Now, how we encourage one another can look a million different ways. Sometimes we encourage each other through prayer. Sometimes we encourage one another by saying, I think you're better than this. Sometimes we encourage each other through a hug or practical support. Sometimes we encourage one another by validating someone's um, fear or sadness or frustration or discouragement when they tell us about the things they're walking through. Sometimes we encourage each other by saying, you should apply for that job. And other times we encourage each other by saying, girl, I think you should quit. <laughs> Ultimately, biblical encouragement is rooted in a posture that says, I am with you, I see you, and I believe that God is with you and that God is at work in you. When you look at the way that Jesus lived his life, I love the ways that which you can tell that he encouraged some people um, in ways that said, hey, you need to check yourself and rein it in. And then with other people, he said, you need to rise up. He paid enough attention to the people around them that he was able to see how they individually needed to be encouraged based on their growth journey. Because here's what we know, that ultimately transformation is deeply individual, is deeply personal. But... What I also believe is that God will use others to encourage us on our journey. Recently, Facebook reminded me that it's been two years since me and my friend and ministry partner, Louis Otero, got to baptize one of our friends, Carlos. 
when Carlos first came to this church, Louis and I got our, were able to get to know him. And while Carlos presents like this super tough, put together guy, as we leaned in and got to know him, we realized that this man was tender and this man was broken. And one of the things I love so deeply about Carlos is that from the very start, he did not play games. He let us know that he had made some choices uh, that really hurt people, particularly the person he loves the most in the world, and that the consequences he was facing were in fact well-deserved, they were real, and that he still was not sure how things would play out. But week after week, Carlos let us journey with him. And during that season, I remember watching Louis, who I love and respect so much, pour into Carlos, giving him truth, but a truth that was so saturated in love and grace because ultimately the truth was never sugarcoated. You never doubted that what Louis was doing is that he wanted Carlos to become a better version of who he was. This is what it means to be an encouraging community. This is what it means for us to be the church. We not only want the best for one another, that we ultimately look for opportunities and ways in which we can encourage one another on our individual journeys. And of course, as I invite Pastor Jake back up, we know that this is sometimes easier said than done. That's definitely a community I want to be a part of. Uh, The one that Carla defined, uh, oftentimes for me at least, it's how. (laughs) How, how How do we put this into action? What are the habits that we need to do individually to create such a culture? For me, I remember just a couple of years ago, one of the hardest moments in my life uh, was a season in where my community, the people I live with, for various reasons, we had a relational breakdown. And I remember the emotions at the time, if you ever have had something like that happen to you, it's unwelcome companions like shame or doubt in yourself, frustration, resentment. These were all things I was dealing with at the time. It was disorienting. It was disorienting knowing, was it my fault? If it wasn't my fault, whose fault was it? And I I remember trying to, to dissect in the past where it could have gone wrong. In my life, that was one of the hardest seasons Jesus also had a very hard season with his community. One thing about Jesus is that he was regularly found in the context of community. Jesus was perfect. He was the human human prototype. He was the perfect version of who we could be. Yet, he had a pretty messy community. How do we know this? Jesus entrusted one of his closest friends with very specific information. And that friend took that information and told the people who had the most to gain about it. This is Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus. I mean, talk about emotional damage. But it wasn't just emotional damage, was it? This meant death for our King Jesus. But what could only be described as a miracle from God, Jesus raises again three days later. We experienced this just two weeks ago, telling us that this was God's plan all along, and we couldn't see what God had in store. One thing that we do forget, though, is that there was a gap between when Jesus raised from the dead and when he ascended into heaven. That was 40 days And he had a mission. His mission was to set up the church for millennia. It's a pretty big mission. He had 40 days. Now, if you were him, what would you do during those 40 days? Well, for me, the last place that I would go would be community. I mean, that's where it literally got him killed. But consider this. This is uh, in Acts where we were reading earlier. It says, after his death, he presented himself alive to the disciples in many different settings over a period of 40 days. In face-to-face meetings, he talked to them about things concerning the kingdom of God, and they met and they ate meals together. Jesus re-engaged with community. 
Now, I'm not saying that we should go back to cycles of abuse and neglect when it comes to community. The person, Judas, who betrayed Jesus was no longer there, so it was a semi-healthy community to go back to. But what Jesus did, if we're going to be honest, is kind of like experiencing church hurt with people in the church and yet still saying, I'm going to make my church community a priority, even in the midst of the pain. That's what Jesus did. But you might say, Jake, Jake, that that sounds great, but what about the mission that Jesus had? He had 40 days to accomplish the busiest mission of his life. He was probably the busiest man, you'd think, of all time. I mean, he had the most to do, and yet he made community a, a priority, and it wasn't in spite of his community that the mission ultimately was successful. We're here today, right? It was successful. Actually, it was because of his community. Those disciples, let me just read to you where a couple of them went to reach the ends of the earth when it came to telling people about Jesus. Thomas journeyed to India Matthew to the Mediterranean, James led spiritually in Jerusalem, and Paul spread the gospel in the heart of the world, which was Rome at the time. So how do we create community? I want to mention three habits that at least I see in the story of Jesus and his journey and story when it comes to community. Here's the first one if you're going to write anything down. The first habit was this. Jesus made it a commitment. I don't know if there's any greater commitment in the history of the world than dying to the hands of your your community and saying, I'm still going to try when it comes to it. But at least for me, oftentimes, uh, community can sometimes feel more like a burden than a blessing. And in the midst of those feelings, Jesus still said, I'm going to make this a priority. Maybe for you this means crossing out every Thursday or every Sunday or maybe every week that you meet in your growth group saying this is, there's nothing else that's going to come in between this time with my community. Here's the second one. If you want to write it down, keep it consistent. Has anyone done like P90X or um, Insanity, any of those like crazy fitness programs? Okay, a couple of you. Uh, I've done both. <clears throat> I'm a, not, not sure if you could tell by my gigantic muscles or not, but um, not to the point. Um, the fitness instructors for these programs, like, they're pretty hardcore. You know, they, one of my favorite things that they say, they're like, just show up day in. Yeah, some of you are nodding, you know it, like, day in, day out, show up like this is this is the voice that all of them have to me specifically and it's the worst at 6 a.m when you wake up (laughs) yeah you know and you have that voice in your back of the head like show up like do I want to do this today or not sometimes that can be how it feels when it comes to community and yet we all know that consistency is the key to transformation. Showing up every day or whenever we meet, showing the face and, and, and growing with other people. And I've learned this lesson because I've sh- not shown up many times in many workouts in my life. Here's the third one. Practice courage. In light of the three habits that Jesus showed, reluctantly, I went back to community despite the previous hurts. And for me, I don't know what your journey back to community has looked like for your life in the past, if you've had a journey, which we all do. But for me, that meant amazing conversations with people like Carla. Uh, It meant sitting right here every single Sunday and receiving the love of what God had during the 60 minutes that we have together in gathering. It also meant Uh, Some of my best conversations of my life have happened after service, just right out here in in the lobby. These these moments helped me heal when it came to community. Isn't it so funny that our moments of deepest pain, but also deepest joy happen in community? 
with that being truth, I've decided in my own life that the best version of Jake Veda is the one, even with the risk of heartbreak, who re-engages with community. That's the best version of myself. And maybe for you right now, you are at a crossroads hearing this talk. And you're wondering, should I re-engage with community or should I start for the first time? In this moment, let us consider King Jesus, who died at the hands of his community and yet chose community again because he knew that was where the best life happens. As Carla takes us home, you can write this down as the bottom line of our message. The church in here is meant to empower us to be the church out there. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. When Jake and I were preparing for this talk, we knew that as much as we wanted to communicate the value and the vision around us joining community, around you being a part of community, we knew that ultimately what we needed to do and wanted to do was make sure that our church family also understood that the work we do in here to connect well is deeply tied to the impact we have out there. That in scripture, these two things are very interlinked. Even our opening passage, which centers on the, what the believers did when they were together, ends by explaining how God used that out there. Here's how Acts 47 ends again. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So the Holy Spirit comes at the beginning of Acts 2. The Spirit comes to help the people be more faithful. And he does that by helping this community be a certain kind of community, marked by kindness and generosity and this devotion to God and so forth. And then Acts 2.47 tells us that God used what was happening in there for the good of the people out there. And this was not a strategy for church growth, but Luke is saying as the church committed to being a different kind of community, it impacted others in a very good way. How we as a church family love and care for one another is central to our ability to live on mission according to Scripture. In fact, here's what Jesus says on the matter. John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is so important. I want us to actually read it out loud together on the count of three. One, two, three. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. God called his people, he formed, he created his people to be about his restoration. And in this sense, it makes perfect sense that God would say, if I'm going to use you to be about my love, if you are saying you want to live on mission, on purpose, then you, then we need to play by different rules. Because we aren't merely a community, we're meant to be a community that reflects the love of God to the world. If the end goal was merely that we be a community or that we join in a community, then we could merely go and join any of the great communities around us, like the Rotary Club or Orange Fitness or a pickleball group. But that is not what Scripture is saying. Scripture tells us that if we want to be the sort of community that reflects God's love to the world, which we were called and created to do, then we need to learn to be a different sort of community in here. I love how theologian Dale Andrews says, we are responsible to each other and for each other. The family of God is supposed to be a family like no other. So may we individually and collectively Say yes to being a different kind of community. And just a moment, we would love to give us an opportunity to practice and to lean into that. And here's how we're going to do that. The worship team is going to come and lead us in two songs. And then members from our prayer team are going to come to the front of the stage. If you're outside, there'll be some people outside. And during these next two songs, you have an opportunity to lean in, to practice, and to receive a specific kind of support that you should receive in the family of God. So for instance, if you need encouragement, ask them to pray for that. If you need wisdom in a specific area of your life, ask them for that. If you need to confess something, this is a place to do it. If you just need God, someone to pray a blessing over you, ask for that. 
Dude, in my own life last week, I thought life was falling apart because of a leak and a flood, whatever, like Wednesday and then insurance and blah, 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 and life is already hard. And I already was in full overwhelm. And then Friday, I had a phone call from someone I love with all my heart, and they told me what's happening in their life. And it was like, I was already on the floor. I was already on the verge of breakdown. Then the second call came in. It's like, dear Lord, life does not care how often you get hit by waves. But when we come here, we shouldn't feel ashamed by saying, dude, your girl just needs some prayer. This is our opportunity for us to do that, whatever that prayer may look like in your individual life. Because again, we are not merely a community. We're meant to be a different kind of community, unlike any other. So may we lean into that. May we expect that. May we help Eastlake Church be unique and to live on mission faithfully together. So if you would all stand with me, here's how this is going to work. I'm going to pray for us, and when I'm done praying and I say amen, the worship team is going to start leading us in those two songs. And again, if you need any sort of prayer, or maybe you want to pray for someone else, whatever that might look like, please come up and receive that prayer. And again, if you're outside, we're here for two songs, and we love, again, to live into this vision, into this mission of being a different kind of community. Let me pray for you. Lord, help us to live on mission. Help us to be a different type of community, Lord. Here we want to center you. God, may your spirit rest on us individually and as a group and not merely for our own sake, God, because I know that ultimately you desire to do good things in us and through us. God, shape us, guide us, mature us to be faithful to our call as a community. Lord, help us to show others your love through the love we experience through you and one another. Amen.